Yeah, I know, I know that there's something funny in there about holding the record. I'm just not sure what it is exactly. I will by the end of the workshop. All right, so, so let's take Rachel's story for a moment and let's hold it up against this idea of affiliation, disaffiliation, and, that, and how that's reflected in her story. We typically, go back to those markers of Catholic identity, we typically identify affiliation around around these, these kinds of activities, behaviors, uh, this level of participation in the faith community. All right, so, so holding on to that for a moment, what seems to be happening then in, in this new territory of ours is that instead of being fully within that, that original circle of identification, Rachel highlights, you saw it in Beatrice, she highlights what seems to be happening with young adults about, well, they're kind of stretching that bubble a little bit. <laughs> Then it gets stretched a little more as they start to question and they start to expand what their thinking is. You heard Rachel talk about that. They stretch it a little bit more. And you know what happens using your image of a bubble. You only get so far before the bubble burst. And, and you move outside the bubble to disaffiliation. See, I, I think this is one of the fascinating dynamics that is actually going on today in our church is, is those bubbles that increasingly, what, what happened in my year as a baby boomer and, and prior to my generation, when you had a very clear set of markers, here's what it means to be Catholic. And, this, and if you're in, you're in. And if you're not this, then, then you're not. But what you see is that people are stretching those bubbles. And, and this is fascinating, because I think we've been stretching those bubbles since the time of the apostles. I mean, I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think if you read the Acts of the Apostles, I think Paul and, uh, and Peter had di different definitions of the bubble for a long time. So that one must have been a very interesting conversation. But you start to see what happens here as they start to move outside the bubble. And so it starts, here's Rachel. Rachel's on the outside of that bubble, right? She finds herself right on the edge there. This is probably what she means by Catholic-ish or Catholic-adjacent, as long as she's just used recently. All right, but here's what starts to happen. Using Rachel as an image for a lot of young adults, think about those five hungers for a moment and watch what begins to happen. Think about their hunger for meaning and purpose and where are these hungers of, for hunger for connection, hunger for a sense of belonging, the hunger for recognition, where do they start to be met? What's been interesting in the research is I came across something called the dinner party. This is worth Googling. Apparently, um, it was created by four or five women who all experienced significant loss in their life and felt there was nowhere to go where they could share that sense of loss. So they created their own little dinner club where over dinner and wine, they talked about their sense of loss. The dinner party now has moved to 70 different cities. They have an online presence. They have a guidebook for how to create your own dinner party. And, they have, and, here's, and here's how you enter the, the rules that you follow. Here's the, the processes that the dinner party has. Fascinating sense of community. People are creating their own sense of community in different ways. A second area was, uh, I, I don't have it on here, the nuns and nons. I don't know if you've seen this article in NCR, but there's this group called the nuns and the nons. I'm, I'm really trying to get my pronunciation down. And it's where these religious orders of women are starting to have regular meals with the nuns, with young adults who aren't connected. And they've even gone so far, not only do they pray together, but the nuns have gone to visit the nuns in their work setting so they can begin to understand part of their reality. The nuns and the nuns have become a great example of what accompaniment looks like. I'll come back to accompaniment. Um, we found in young adults, we asked them about where they find that sense of community. Fitness centers. That somebody has proposed that fitness centers may well be the new church for, for young adults. Now think about this. Fitness centers, what happens in their fitness centers? They come in and what? They're greeted by name. They're missed when they're not there. The fitness center helps them establish goals and objectives, helps them to meet those objectives, celebrates their successes, and celebrates their life milestones. Huh. Hunger for connection, hunger for recognition. And they're finding it in the fitness center. Now this was very interesting. This just happened within the last month. I'm watching the Planet Fitness um, app, or their TV app, and it was fascinating. And the two sound bites that 
come out of the act, we think about the study. Number one is no commitment necessary. 10 bucks down, 10 bucks a month, or something like that. But no commitment necessary. And the second one, plan of fitness. When the world judges you, we go. Think about that. I don't think they should be paying royalties to St. Mary's Press. That's what I'm thinking. I think, they, I think they wear the study. But look what they're doing. Now, if, if you look at that through the lens of the hungers, that makes sense to me. And it's the same for, for meditation centers and yoga centers. That people are, that, that spiritual hunger is there. That hunger for connection, for, for recognition is there. Where are they going for those hungers to be fed? That that becomes, that becomes part of the issue. Do you, do you see what's happening? Do you see how the territory is shifting? And I, I, find, this, I find this particularly hopeful because the hunger is already there. I, I think, now, theologically, I think the hunger is imprinted on their hearts because they're made in the image and likeness of God. So I think it's imprinted in their spiritual DNA. The challenge is going to be as church, how do we respond to those hungers? That that becomes a wider question. Here's how Edward phrased it. He said, I don't think myself as a religious or spiritual person. I consider myself to be a good person. Now, now this is interesting. Wouldn't you want to know his definition of religious or spiritual? See, that, that's one of, the, one of the challenges here. This is a PS. One of the challenges when you work with young adults is this whole idea of clarifying terms. And sometimes we use language that may mean something different for them. And so, so this I was sharing with somebody on Saturday morning. I, I'm now part of our young adult ministry team in my parish. I don't know. I went into the confessional and I came out as a young adult minister. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm uh, meeting with our team on Saturday morning, and our team is all young adults, uh, and they in our VR and she's closer to being a young adult. I can't even see that in my rear view mirror, but there we are. But but the challenge with them is to start to look at our parish and our territory of the parish, and, and what do we know about our parish? What do we know about our young adults? And and what language are we using? And how do we talk about these experiences? I'm, I'm just so looking for how this turned out. But one of the things I've learned is that you have to suspend your language. You can't assume that when you use language that it means the same thing for them. So we have to make sure we're clear about it. So language like religious or spiritual, Catholic, it's worth thinking about. All right, so what are those common denominators? Now, they, they, because, it, because it's imprinted, we as church, they say that, well, if you make it now, I love this language here, what do you call it? A rational argument, provable evidence. And I'm thinking, that doesn't exist. We don't have God here. We don't have mystery. We don't have transcendence. But, but there, it says to me they're open to something. Now, where does that something come from? You and me. I'm, com I'm convinced that they are looking for credible witnesses. We become those credible witnesses. Maybe in your ministry in the past you've heard the phrase that for some young people, you may be the only gospel they ever read. Well, it strikes me that we want to be those kind of credible witnesses for our young people. They need to see faith in action in our lives. I think they're looking for something. Sometimes we become that argument. We become the rational argument for the, for the existence and the presence of God, that faith is important. Why? Because look out. There's no worse advertising, by the way, for this whole venture than grumpy Christians. Because nobody's going to, Frank, Pope Francis was right when he talked about that. Um, nobody wants to sign up to be grumpy. Well, I, actually, there might be some people, but we know who they are, and we try to avoid them. But the majority of us, I want to be joyful. So tell me where your joy comes from. All right, so Doug says it this way. I wouldn't rule out someday returning. Somebody made a really convincing argument, an intellectual argument. And just as a PS, by the way, here. I read in some of these interviews, and I'm sure you've seen some of this elsewhere, about they have more faith in science than they do in religion. Well, I actually think scientists are the modern-day mystics. I think that any scientist worth their salt will say things like, you know, we know more about what we don't know than what we do know. You know, there's more out there. We're always, so this whole idea of making an intellectual argument, scientists will say, well, that's not science. Science is all about mystery. And I just I think there's something about that that's just pretty cool. But this whole idea that they're looking. All right, so having said that then, here's what I'd like you to do. So take a moment to think through. Given the stories you've heard, the data that, that we've been sharing here, what are you hearing in the data and in the stories? What's emerging for you? As, you? as you step back and look at the territory that we've been describing here, what's emerging for you? What are you starting 
to think through what are some possibilities here in terms of what might be in a map without without premature judgment on this are there some implications here and i like this last question what if we started to think about the experiences of the disaffiliated as a mirror as a way of reflecting back to the church their experience of the church what are we hearing? What are we finding? So I'm going to invite you at your table to take three or four minutes at your table to look at this, and then I want to show you my last, my third video around this. So what's emerging for you as you listen to the stories and listen to the data? Just kind of share that at your table if you would. Just take three minutes to do that. Doesn't feel like we can just take those questions back in the whole afternoon and get that question. What is all that you All right, so, can I get a snack? What you're saying? What, what seems to be emerging? What are you thinking about? What are you hearing from your folks at your table? What what is kind of coming forward? Let's just get a cross section. What's what's coming forward? The mirror is distorted because even within the church, we, we have so many people that have different opinions. Um, you know, if, I'm, I'm a DRE. If I take a poll of people in a room as DREs, there's still a lot of people in that. So our mirror is distorted, so no wonder they're looking at it and saying it's an unauthentic yeah. image. Welcome to the chaos. Yeah. What else do you think? What's emerging for you when you think about this? What's emerging? What are the insights, the indications? What are you starting to hear? What are you starting to think about? You think about these stories, please. I, I think it's, it's about relationship. It's about company. It's about relationship in the video that I mentioned this here is I didn't hear about relationship. I think all of us can look at our own journey of faith. There's someone or a group of people that help us in our faith journey. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that. And I don't and I don't and I think that's part of the map that has never changed, by the way. Mm -hmm. but from that earlier image when we start, I think this whole idea is a relational ministry with I think that issue of accompaniment is really powerful. What else do you think? Please I mean, I think we still feel very uncomfortable listening. Uh, I think it was really insightful when you said that listen without making a judgment or without trying to craft a response. I think that the ability to listen deeply and, and, and see those stories as sacred, I think that we still struggle a lot with that. Yeah, you know, this afternoon, and for those of you who are saying for the afternoon session around this idea, how do you engage young people in, in faith talk, with God talk? One of the things I would maintain is that uh, there was an action that youth ministry said you have to earn the right to be heard. I don't think this ever changed. And so if we, if we really want to be heard, you earn that right. And how do we do that by being in a relationship? You go back to the previous comment. So this whole idea of, that, of how do we enter into a relationship and only then can we be heard. So I, I think that's an important piece here, this idea of listening to learn as opposed to listening to response. If we jump into responding right away, we become, we just reaffirm their experience. Yeah, on the Please. Can we say that we are all looking and questioning? I uh, think we can. <laughs> she said, can we say that we're all uh, looking and questioning? I suspect we are. I think the apostles are a great example of that. Church history is filled with that. We call it the Reformation, the Inquisition. I mean, we have all kinds of time before. But yeah, I. But, but isn't there something nice about we're all on the same journey? Right. And you know what? And if young adults knew that, I think that's attractive. Like, that's really a, that's an interesting comment. Here we are. So we have a place. I think when uh, all the stories talk about judgment, the truth being judgmental, which makes me think that we are not transferring uh, Jesus Christ coming and spending time with sinners. <laughs> Yeah, this whole, this whole uh, Pope Francis talked about ministry to the marginalized. You know, it smelled like a sheep. He even proclaimed a whole year of mercy and forgiveness. So I'm glad we handled that. You know, we got all that mercy stuff out of the way last year. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it is exactly that. Um, so watch what happens then. Watch, here's what I'm thinking. Here are some questions we want to be asking as pastoral leaders. Things to consider. And I don't want to call it a map yet. I just want to say implications for now because it's safer for me. But first is the difference between membership and accompaniment. And I think that's one of the tensions we're going to experience.
sometimes folks say, give me, tell me how I can go back to the church. And I, I still maintain that's the wrong question. This is not a recruitment issue. I think what this issue is, a accompaniment issue. See, and, and here's my suspicion. If we become the kind of community that is willing to enter into a relationship with all of our youth and young lives, and to walk with them on their journey, this afternoon I'll use the image of the Emmaus story and why I think that works, all right? So I'll come back to this this afternoon. But if we become that kind of a community that's willing to walk with them on their journey, then we become the kind of community I think they want to belong to. But you see that the first step, though, is not recruitment. The first step is I walk with you. All right, so I, so I think that's an important distinction. And I want to highlight the very last line on that bullet point, that one of the big shifts for us is this idea of a belonging leading to believing. My generation, baby boomer generation, we would have been the believing leads to belonging. We would look for a community that believed what we believe, and that's where we would want to belong. But in, in a postmodern world, roughly the world post 1960s, 1970s, the process had reversed. That people today are looking for a place first where they belong. And then educational theorists have said, and the second, there's a middle section here, they call it the behaving section. I look for a community where I belong. I begin to behave the way those people behave. And now I want to know what you believe that causes you to behave that way. You, you, you see, you get to the same place, but the starting point is different. I think Francis was really clear about this. Francis' starting point for evangelization and catechesis is compassion. If you, if you look at, you know, if I ask you, what's your favorite photo op of, of Pope Francis? I bet a lot of you are going to think about the time he was washing the feet of kids and washing the feet of Muslim women. I mean, it, it's acts of compassion are the starting point here. doesn't mean our doctor is not important. All that's really important. But the starting point is different. I, I, I use the image. If we ever hope to educate their heads, it's going to start by engaging their hearts. That that's the starting point here. That, that seems to fit. And one of the things that is the, side, the concept of faith itself has become more challenging. And so we as pastoral leaders, when we answer the so what question, for those who say I could be a good person without faith, do we know why faith is important? Can we speak about that credibly? You know, do we have the words in that second session about finding words? Do we have the words to help us understand why faith itself is important or why community is important? This afternoon, I want to talk clearly about Catholicism is countercultural because we are a communal religion. And what does that mean for us? And what does it look like? And, how, and then the fourth, if that's true for us, can we help parents in the same way? What about parents who, can we help them find the language for this? And, and then here's my other four questions. If we have young people who are on the margins out here, what about the families on the margins? Can we, are, are we able as, as pastoral leaders to identify who are the families that have walked away? Where, and where have they gone? Do we know who they are? It's that, it's that move from maintenance ministry to missionary ministry. Can we go to them uh, for those families who are on the margins? A deeper, quicker, and I'll come back to this this afternoon in, in a big way, but I am increasingly convinced that, that our young people are asking uh, deeper and deeper questions at earlier and earlier ages. And so if we fall into the trap of doing ministry as a ministry as entertainment, uh, the wonder of thinking, I'll bide my time and I'm out of here. So unless we find a way that we help them express those questions at an earlier, earlier age with credible witnesses who are willing to listen to the questions. And, I, and this is just a PS, but I, I used to believe that the challenge was this. The challenge with middle school kids, and I have to admit right off, uh, I don't do middle school. I can't. I, I just can't. It's not my gift. But I'm not sure about adults either, so, you know. I'm in that in between state. And I'm teaching two universities. That's not a pleasant thought, is it? But, but and, oh, man, what? Oh, 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 so the challenge was, with middle school, I always thought the challenge was to somehow answer their questions. And with high school, the, the challenge was to question their answers. I always thought that that was kind of the approach. Well, now I'm finding middle school questions are really pretty deep, and I've got to find a way to help foster the, that question there. So I think that's important. What do we do with the sort of Catholics, the Catholic-ish, Catholic adjacent? 
is there a changing definition? Uh, I've been struggling with, uh, in the Jewish tradition, they talk about secular Jews. And secular Jews are those who grew up in the, in the Jewish tradition. They've been inculcated with all the values in the tradition, but they don't practice or they don't attend synagogue. Are they Jewish or not? So can you be Catholic and not go to Mass? I wonder. And, and you're part of why I'm wondering about this. And I, this is great not having the answers, but you can't hold me to anything. And so what I'm thinking about is those people in your head. Do you think those people that you've been carrying around in your head, think about how they've been immersed in Catholic values. And those values have been lived out in their life. And the only thing you're not doing, now I know this is a big knot, but they're not coming to Mass. I'm going to bet they're praying. I'm going to bet they're trying to be people. I, I bet they're trying to live out. I don't know. I just think what a fascinating conversation this is. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I find it a little bit exciting about this. And because one of the things I'm struggling with, have we given the impression that there needs to be a 100% cognitive assent to teaching in order to worship together? Let that sink in for a moment. Have we given the impression that there has to be 100% cognitive assent to teachings in order to worship together? And then my facetious question is, do you think we've ever had 100% cognitive assent to anything in the church? Just let that sink in, because, because I, think that, I think there's a truth underneath that statement that's really, really important. And sometimes people get the impression, well, you know what, you know what I'm getting at. There we are. So, so listen to Lauren. This is the last video I'd like to show. Listen to Lauren, and I'm going to encourage you to listen early on in the video, within the first, I think, 40 seconds, how she describes herself. This just caught my attention. So listen to Lauren. pieces of God are going to be in everything on the planet. That kind of naturalism and the connection with Mother Nature is something that I have really adopted into my personal beliefs. Growing up, I would describe my involvement with the Catholic Church as intense in a positive way. I went to Catholic preschool and I went to public school up until high school when I went to a Catholic high school. We went to Mass every Sunday. Nowadays, when I go to church, I go when my whole family is going to church or when my grandparents invite me to church specifically for something. I would self-identify as a spiritual Catholic with postmodernist philosophies. My identities as a spiritual and Catholic are two separate but complete identities within themselves. And postmodernism basically means that I think that asking questions and discovering things about the universe and the world that we live in are positive. But at the end of the day, because none of us are going to know the ultimate truth of what this universe looks like, there's no point in discussing who's right and who's wrong as long as we're not hurting each other. What has been most important for me in the Catholic tradition has been definitely the social justice teachings. I find that when I get to contribute back to the world that has given me so many blessings, I feel so connected to God and to all the people around me. I was always really involved in making sure that the LGBTQIA community in my world always felt welcomed and loved by me, especially as a Catholic, so that I could present to them this image of, I'm a Christian and I love you, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with you. I just want to be here and support you. To portray myself in a way that says, through my actions, I am showing you the love of Jesus and God, what I've experienced as a Catholic. If we had that attitude of, we're all going to experience this wonderful divinity differently and separately while coming together and sharing that with each other, then I think that that kind of space would allow for more people to feel welcomed. I would love to see more movement to have women deacons and priests in the church. As much progress as we've made as a Catholic church, I feel that that is something that is long overdue. And that's something that I personally feel was definitely incredibly difficult when deciding to stay with the Catholic Church and being a woman. 
growing up, I kind of assumed that if you were Catholic, you had to follow specific political beliefs. You had to follow specific lifestyle choices. Everybody had kind of the same attitude and beliefs and lifestyles. That is where I felt like I was on the outskirts of this community. Because if I didn't see myself fitting into whatever this looked like, then I wouldn't feel comfortable staying there and building a community because I felt like I had to hide certain parts of myself. Those certain parts of myself that I wanted to hide are parts of myself that I believe come from experiences that God gave me, that I was made exactly as God wanted me to be made. Did you catch what she said about her self-description? She said, I'm spiritually Catholic with postmodern philosophies. When she said that, I actually stopped the tape and said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and she's so articulate, and just as a PS on, and her mother's a youth minister, so go figure that one. But it, it's just fascinating to listen. And so, so Lauren's story, Rachel's story, Beatrice, and the, and the others, and just as a PS, there's two other videos that we've done, and all these videos are available to you for free on that on that website that keeps coming up. That you can you can use those videos, and there's discussion guides that go with the videos because the intent for St. Mary's Press is to further the conversation. Right? So that, that was kind of a commercial about this. But 